to this panel discussion on Germany's leadership role in European in the Europe, Europe's Green Deal. Um, my name is Susie Dennison. I'm the director for the European Power Programme at the European Council on Foreign Relations, and I'm really delighted to be um, moderating this discussion um, this afternoon. In terms of the um, concept um, of, of, of today's discussion, um, the reason for bringing you all together um, is, uh, is the moment that we're at um, in terms of uh, European climate leadership. We're a few weeks after COP27, where on the one hand, we had um, the historic agreement around a loss and damage fund, um, but on the other hand, no tangible progress um, on national targets on, um, for decarbonisation. Um, and so, and we have the outstanding challenge um, as we um, uh, have a year ahead of us until COP28, COP28 um, of identifying um, the financing for the loss and da damage fund and building um, uh, the, uh, the the relationships around um, continuing to um, to push global uh, progress forward. We're also at a moment where we're heading into the cold phase of winter um, in Europe with good progress um, among European states, um, both on energy conservation measures um, and on filling storage facilities and securing um, supplies um, for this winter. Uh, we're currently at over 96% of um, gas storage, um, according to the IEA. And Germany has obviously played a prominent role in both dimensions um, of this picture, both the climate diplomacy angle um, and also um, uh, the way that we're equipping ourselves within Europe um, to deal with uh, the energy dimension um, of, the, of the crisis we're facing. But um, under, um, uh, under that prominence, um, it's, it's not necessarily such a clear cut role as we might have expected um, from the German government um, this time a year ago uh, before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So the idea of today is to really explore that picture, look at what has been done and what more could be done. We're really excited um, to be organising this, really pleased to be organising this um, in cooperation with the European Investment Bank. So before we jump into the panels, I just want to hand over to Heike Freimuth, um, head of the Berlin office of European Investment Bank, um, for some welcoming remarks from her too. Thank you, Susan. And we are equally excited to have this uh, event here today because we think we are at a, at a very important juncture, at a very interesting uh, moment where um, through uh, the energy crisis, which of course we didn't foresee, uh, this, this provides also for us an opportunity to really push green transition. Uh, much faster than than we had foreseen, and and to look into how we can better structure um, and and also work at various angles, not only energy supply but also energy efficiency, energy savings. So take really a comprehensive view, and of course the EIB as the EU Climate Bank is um, is uh, has this very much as a focus, and uh, tries also to push this agenda in in Germany. Thank you. Looking forward to the discussion. Brilliant. Well, let's um, uh, kick into um, uh, the discussion now because we have um, a, a great lineup uh, to take us through these issues. We're going to be hearing first from Otmar Edenhofer, Director and Chief Economist for the Potsdam Institute um, for Climate Impact uh, Response. Um, then we're going to uh, be hearing from Philip Steinberg from the German, Fe German Federal Ministry uh, for Economic um, uh, Affairs and Climate Action. Um, and then we're going to hear um, from Heike uh, Freimuth with her substantive hat on, um, on, on the European role um, in this picture. So Otmar, if I can, um, let's hand over first um, to you um, to uh, give us some introductory remarks. What, how, how do you think um, uh, Germany has been playing a role as a climate leader and um, what, what more do you um, hope for or foresee? Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, do you see my slides and can you yes, hear Yes, we can see your slides, it's perfect. Wonderful. Yeah, so um, what I would like to do is uh, to talk a little bit about the pathways to climate neutrality at the global level in Europe and also in, in, in Germany, uh, just to highlight the, the, a few facts and to, to emphasize the enormous importance for transition. And let me start with the, the, the global level because it is, it is worthwhile to look a little bit what we have to do uh, when we want to keep the global mean temperature, let's say well below two degree with an effort to achieve 1.5, which is uh, um, uh, the, the goal of the Paris Agreement. And this uh, limit has been emphasized and confirmed 
by the most recent COP. And uh, so this is a very important picture here. Uh, so we have to, to reduce emissions very soon in an order of magnitude annual between five to 6%. By the mid of century, we have to achieve net carbon neutrality, which is basically means there is no longer a net inflow of emissions into the uh, atmosphere as, as, a, as a disposal space. Uh, we can only do this if we can achieve carbon dioxide uh, removal technologies and we can apply them. So this is not a substitute for emission reduction. We need a fast reduction of net emissions, but we have to, we have to compensate at a global scale residual emissions for net zero. And therefore, we need investments in negative emissions in the long run. I would like to emphasize this because this is widely ignored in, in, in many debates. It is very present at the global level, but it is less present at the European and at the German level. And these ne negative emission technologies have to become a very important in the second half of a century, but we have to start the investments already now. So this is, this is very important, and these technologies, in particular CDR technologies, are not uh, available at, at scale. We have a few pilot projects on bioenergy and carbon capture and storage uh, on direct air capture. Uh, there are a lot of political risks that have to be taken into account when we talk about this. But let me, so this is just the emission, uh, the, the emission part of, of, of the picture, but it is also about innovation and necessary innovations are lagging behind. And let me highlight a few of them because we have to scale up renewable electricity uh, 10 times increase in global solar power between 2020 and 30 at the global scale. We need hydrogen electrolyzers uh, also uh, when we want to reach the repower EU goal. And also we need 80% market volume for electric vehicles and we need, of course, carbon capture and storage uh, by mid of century. So it is quite easy to highlight these requirements. But what, what I would like to emphasize is um, that the, we know something, how technologies uh, uh, are developed. And they most, most of the time develop uh, at a, uh, with a logistic uh, a diffusion curve, which you can see on, on the right hand side. And this is an example for the electrolyzer capacity at the EU in gigawatts. And what is shown here is by 2030, this is the EU goal. And this is basically the most likely trajectory, a very optimistic trajectory, how the diffusion process for uh, uh, hydrogen uh, can evolve over time. And it is clear that in the short run, this is an over, almost an over ambitious goal. And we are not there to achieve uh, these technologies. In the end, by 2040 and 50, we might be in a position to provide the sufficient supply for hydrogen, but we are not there. And therefore, I'm not saying this is not feasible, but what I am saying is we need almost uh, a, a very uh, rapid upscaling project uh, for hydrogen, but also for renewables. And we need also some investments for carbon capture and storage because we have not the regulatory framework available uh, to do this. So this is uh, also on, on the direct air capture side. Uh, uh, there are a few pilot projects, not at scale. And of course, lifestyle changes, energy efficiency is important. Where do we stand at the European level? This is where the emissions might evolve over time under the current policies. And you see basically by 2050, we are not at the carbon neutral way. At the, Euro the European Green Deal sets this goal, but uh, then this needs a much more rapid transformation in the building and the transport sector. And again, at the European level, negative emission technologies are absolutely needed. Now, let me come to a few facts on, 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 on the implication of the European Green Deal on the oil and the gas market. Even before 2030, we will see a rapid decline of oil and gas demand. The Green Deal works in effect like a long-term demand cartel, especially for oil and gas. And assuming that the EU's ambitions remain constant, the interplay between the effort sharing regulation and the UATS2, which is basically for transport and building, will force European countries to reduce the emissions, in particular in the transfer and in the building sector. And everything 
depends on the institutional setting. And this is something uh, which is very important uh, uh, as an institutionally boundary condition to achieve that goal. Of course, uh, this reduction uh, in Europe needs much more coordination. And I think uh, so we have uh, basically proposed a fund to pay savings premium to the member states. So this might be something to uh, facilitate and to accelerate the reduction of the gas and the oil uh, demand in at Europe. Where do we stand in Germany? So this is uh, Germany's pathway to climate neutrality is even more ambitious than uh, the, the European one because it is five years earlier. Again, uh, we have to phase out fossil fuels uh, uh, completely. Uh, and also we need uh, negative emissions. Without negative emissions, uh, we will not be successful. Climate neutrality by 2045 requires a complete phase out of fossil fuels. And in a nutshell, uh, this requires the key elements, massive energy uh, efficiency improvements, almost a full-scale decarbonization of electricity by 2030, increasing electrification of currently non-electric demands, and also a default fossilization of the residual, residual non-electricity demand. So this is this is an enormous uh, an, an enormous package, and uh, uh, it's 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 not a secret that we are not there. It can be achieved. Uh, there is a, an option to combine energy efficiency and carbon neutrality, but this is something where we uh, where we have to speed up dramatically. So let me say something on the on energy security. So we will see that uh, the availability of natural gas in Germany, there is a supply gap around 30% according to our calculation. So the, the reduction of the primary energy consumption for gas, so needs a much more faster reduction than uh, it would be, uh, it would be necessary otherwise just uh, to achieve carbon neutrality. So we have to be a little bit faster here. I'm not completely pessimistic. This is possible, but this is something which brings a new element into the uh, equation. So let me summarize. I'm, I'm, I will stop here. At the global scale, we need a massive reduction of emissions. Of course, uh, we need uh, a massive upscaling of technological innovation, not just in the renewable energy sector, we need a massive investment in hydrogen, uh, in negative emission technologies, and also in carbon capture and storage. So at the European scale, uh, this is something which is with current policies, it's not achievable. So we need, we have to speed up. Uh, it's possible we have the institutional setting like the ETS-1 in the power and the industry sector, an emerging ETS-2 for transport and building. But it is open to debate if this, are, this institutional structure is strong enough at the German level. So this is, again, an enormous uh, challenge to achieve this. And uh, so the reduction of uh, the gas supply and the gas demand, according to the, uh, the Ukrainian war, allows us to combine a carbon neutrality with the uh, energy security. Again, it's in principle possible but it is up to the political environment and it is up to us, so to say, uh, to what extent we will be successful. But uh, I would like to provide you a few numbers uh, and, and a picture of the challenges ahead of us. And how to do this, uh, I think we can clarify this in our discussion. Thank you very much indeed. You managed to pack an incredible amount of information into those um, 10 minutes um, and indeed given us a nice segue um, into our next speaker. Um, so I'd like to turn to, to Philip Steinberg. We've heard um, from Otmar Edenhofer that um, there has been much planning done, um, much achieved, but still some significant gaps, um, uh, both in terms of um, uh, the, the innovation um, that is needed and um, the investment in the significant scale up of of renewables um, sort of looking at the, at the picture um, uh, within Europe, and then major geopolitical implications of um, the, the transitions that we're going through, um, which will have to be managed in our relationships um, with other countries. Um, so I'd be keen to hear from you. Um, do, do you are you worried about the same things? Um, does this picture chime um, 
uh, with, uh, with, with, with the vision you have from where you're sitting and, and what might you um, emphasize differently or see differently? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, thank you for, for the invitation. And I, I mean, I can take it from where Otmar Edenhofer um, left it, actually. I mean, from a more practical perspective, you know, I mean, I'm heading the new um, directorate for energy security and economic stabilization. That's something I think which doesn't exist in, in many countries. And uh, that shows a little bit of the challenge because, I mean, I think the, 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 um, the, 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 the the challenge Otmar Edenhofer has shown us again, where do we, what do we need to achieve? I mean, this is very ambitious. We, we all know that Germany and, and it, Otmar has, has mentioned it, we wanna be carbon neutral by 20, uh, 2045. And uh, that is, is, is of course, was always an ambitious goal. It is even more ambitious now with the, with the Ukrainian war crisis actually. And we, are, we have to deal with it. And I mean, um, we in, in the economics and climate action ministry, we started of course with everybody and said, okay, now we want to do a transformation. That's that's our, our goal and we want to decarbonize the economy. Then a couple of months later, when we arrived um, the war started. And uh, I mean, then the weakness of our economy became apparent obviously, and that's the huge dependence um, uh, from Russia, energy depends from Russia. I mean, the, the, the figures are known, but they are still quite fascinating. I mean. 55% of our of our natural gas came from Russia, pipeline gas from Russia, um, um, about 35% um, um, of uh, of the oil um, hard coal also also in this magnitude. So so huge dependency on uh, of of especially um, rather cheap pipeline gas from uh, from Russia. And uh, and now I think the the interesting question is so if you look at Otmar's figures, and I mean, and, and that what we need to achieve. So, how does this Ukrainian war crisis actually? How does it play in? And um, and um, this is this is, I think it's, it's interesting because I think in the in the in the very short run, obviously there 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 are, there are detrimental consequences of the crisis because what we are doing and what my job is, I mean, I'm I'm actually um, trying to to um, establish new LNG terminals. We are uh, we are about plan we are planning to establish six at least six LNG terminals with a capacity of um, up to 50 BCMA, so 50 billion uh, cubic meters of gas. That is almost the quantity we got from um, uh, from Russia in order to actually manage those. They have very we have very long lasting contracts. Uh, we need to actually. Um, have we don't have to, to do everything with contracts and it's not us but it's the companies who are doing it but so this is there is there is this question of how much do we need how much lng do we need and um, but then i mean and i think otmar mentioned it i mean he said there would be a gap of, of about 30 percent depending on on how, what we do and how we plan it but i think this is indeed a challenge it's a challenge that we say and now it's in every on everybody's mind that energy efficiency is a major a major necessity and i mean energy efficiency is not sexy you know i mean there are many other things which are sexy you know to build new 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 on onshore and offshore wind and turbines and so on is sexy uh, photovoltaic is sexy up to a point as well but safe energy you know and, and talk and talk about all this how much insulation do you need what standards do you need and i mean you know that's really really boring um but it's so important i mean because i mean if you look at heat, 50% of our primary energy is heat energy. Um, but I think the war has actually uh, made it apparent how important energy saving is. And we are quite su successful, actually. I mean, we, we have managed uh, to save about 20% um, of, of our gas consumption uh, compared to pre-crisis levels, which is good, not as good as, as we want to. But I think this is, this is a, um, it's, it's, it's a, um, a chance as well that we actually can take it from, uh, from here. But of course, what we need to do is, is now within this crisis where we need to quickly replace and we will need fossil fuels for some time, fossil energy sources, especially gas for some time, we need to replace them from Russia. There we become more independent because we decentralize that. But of course, we need to make sure that, um, that we, we don't forget our, our climate goals, the climate necessities, and uh, the need need for for transformation, and uh, that means, of course, that we need to make sure that whilst replacing it and um, the, the the gas from Russia, of course, it's first it's LNG, but then we will have uh, fixed terminals as well, and we need to make them as green ready as possible, green readiness, and 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 I think there have been 
of studies as well saying we would not be doing that in a sufficient way. That of course depends what do you mean with green readiness, there are different, uh, there's not one definition. Um, but uh, what I want to do is of course uh, um, make them green ready and we are, well, we are very much aware that this will not be always, I mean, we don't want to continue with natural gas, but we need to, to of course, uh, establish a hydrogen um, structure in, uh, in, in Germany. So I think this is, I mean, this is really the, the, the interesting question. So how, do, how, how, how does this crisis we are in, and I mean, the whole world is in, but of course in Germany, we are especially in, in a concern. And, and here, what, how, how, do we, how do we deal with it? And I would say in the very short run, of course, yes, we have about uh, three, uh, eight gigawatts of, uh, of uh, hard coal and uh, lignite uh, power plants in, uh, like in, in service again, and we have taken them out from the reserve. Um, so that is something, of course, in the short run, we are, we are increasing uh, uh, emissions. Uh, but um, if we are well aware of the need to, to save energy, we continue to, to with the transformation, and we, we see that this dependence on, on energy, on, on fossil, fossil energies from other countries is, is really a problem, not only in inverted commas for climate protection reasons, but also because of, of course, geopolitical reasons, then I think this can be a chance to still meet those, uh, those goals Otmar Edenhofer has, has sketched out. But of course, um, this is a huge, um, uh, huge challenge, uh, challenge. So, I mean, I, I, I leave it there. I think we can take, uh, take up many of those, uh, those aspects uh, in, in, in the discussion, but, um, but I think uh, uh, to, to get the balance right between the need, the short run need to replace um, fossil energies, especially from R Russia, whilst at the same time investing in the future, investing in the transformation, that is something which is actually not really, I mean, in our scenarios that wasn't of course uh, included. And so now we have to, in doing that, that's one of my main tasks actually to get the balance right. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and um, uh, uh, th thank you for very sort of um, clear but um, but nuanced reflections on, on, on the challenges as you see them um, from that point of view. And um, uh, interestingly, um, interesting that you highlighted um, the role of uh, energy and efficiency or, or conservation, um, because this this could perhaps be characterized as the um, uh, the ideal area for for German leadership within Europe. I believe your former chancellor was once um, to describe asked to describe what being German meant, and she said, "Well, insulated windows." So um, uh, perhaps there is indeed um, uh, uh, a need for, for for the German voice on 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 the the role that this could play in in, in overall um, uh, climate targets. Um, I want to um, now turn to to you, Heike Freimut, uh, for for some thoughts um, for, from your point of view on um, the, how the European level plays into this. But so so both um, how you see um, uh, the, the the German action connecting to the European level, um, but also um, how um, uh, the, the the work at, um, at EIB connects back into this picture in in terms of what is trying to be achieved. Yeah, thank you very much, Susie. And I think uh, what uh, Otmar uh, demonstrated before, I mean, we have been coming from the Green Deal, which had been launched. And in the meantime, of course, a lot of things ha happened uh, recently than this year, which changed a bit the picture, but which, which also provides an opportunity to, to accelerate and to, to raise more awareness, because I think Green Deal wasn't really in the heads of, uh, of people. And, and these days, I mean, everybody on the street would talk about energy and, and think about before uh, switching on uh, the heating or not. So, so this is also an opportunity to, um, to broaden the picture. And uh, this is what, um, where I think Germany can play also a very important role at the European level to be some kind of an engine also for other countries. Um, and that in, in various respects, um, uh, that, that, I mean, um, what on the European level was an, uh, a very important initiative uh, being launched in addition was definitely Repower EU, which uh, brought into people's mind also so the dimension, not only investing into green transition, investing into uh, green energy supply, but also thinking about energy efficiency, energy savings. And there I see uh, really a crucial role uh, in Germany as a lot of innovation in that area is happening. And that's what we definitely need as we stand still in quite an early stage on what, um, what we need in order to, to get there where we want to get. 
um, so to push for uh, innovative technologies in this area and there to cover the whole range from uh, energy savings, getting getting our industry up to speed uh, in terms of uh, lower emissions, uh, but also to cover the whole range up to uh, buildings um, which are energy efficient. And, and then, of course, innovative um, ways of energy supply, um, getting networks more efficient and, and things like that. And that's where, yes, we see as, as an EIB a role to push uh, innovation as much as possible. Uh, we have been very proud to, to push uh, for the first uh, floating wind farms uh, in Portugal, for example. Um, we, uh, we also um, push innovation in the area of uh, heating pumps, uh, in the area of um, battery production, they are pushing circular economy uh, because we also are getting more conscious in terms of uh, sovereignty um, that uh, we have a lack of raw materials, critical raw materials for, uh, for batteries, for example. So in, in that sense, um, I think Germany can play really uh, a very important role in, in pushing innovation and then also getting others uh, on board, getting, uh, getting a broader um, uh, investment um, uh, push in, in Europe uh, in order to, um, to, to, promote, um, to promote green transition. Um, what I what I what wasn't mentioned probably before, but which is in, in addition to the energy crisis uh, early this year, I think which which gives another dimension is is also a bit of the geostrategic um, uh, situation we are in in between. Um, yeah, China being uh, the major producer for uh, uh, photovoltaic. Um, uh, material, whereas on the other hand, we have now the US, which is which is a massive inflation reduction act, which is also pushing and attracting sometimes even European uh, players in, in that area to move to, to the US. And, and that's where uh, the EU has to play a major role in, in, in keeping that in Europe and developing these technologies in Europe. Thank you at this stage and we are very, I'm very uh, excited to, to get more questions from the public. Great. Thank you very much indeed um, uh, for, for those um, thoughts, Heike. And um, yeah, the, indeed, the, the floor is now open um, to everybody if you want to um, put questions in the, um, the Q&A box and then um, we can um, direct them to their speakers. But while you're thinking about um, what you want to, uh, what you want to ask, I, I have a couple myself and I wanted to uh, pick up from where Heike left off on, on the international picture and, and two different um, aspects of it. So firstly, Heike has mentioned um, the uh, in Inflation Reduction Act um, from um, uh, that we've seen the US introduce. And um, clearly this is something which is causing um, uh, a lot of reflection um, across different uh, European capitals in terms of how um, we should respond uh, to that. So I would be interested um, to hear um, from, from the panelists your thoughts on um, what the elements of that um, should be and how this um, should connect to our broader agenda in terms of engagement um, within um, the, the international system. We heard um, uh, comments in uh, Bruges this weekend from uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen that perhaps this should encourage us to, um, to rethink um, the rules around um, uh, state aid um, uh, with, within the EU um, and respond um, with a more um, nation-led uh, approach um, in, uh, to, to mirror more the, uh, the way that um, the US is working. Um, uh, but uh, I, you know, I, I suppose that's one element um, that would be great to hear thoughts on, um, uh, but also to hear sort of how um, you see the, the transatlantic partnership continuing to work um, around this picture, because clearly one of the positive things um, uh, around, uh, that, that we have seen on the global um, uh, climate agenda this year has been the sort of the re-engagement um, of the US on this front. And so I think um, that there is also um, a, a strong desire in European capitals to, to keep that moving. And then the other part of the picture, which will be great um, to hear comments on um, uh, from, from the panelists um, while we're, we're sort of staying on um, uh, the uh, climate diplomacy, if you like, um, dimension, um, is around the interplay um, uh, between 
uh, the choices that we're making internally within um, Europe, at, at which many of you have sort of characterized as the short term um, response to, to the energy crisis. Um, and uh, the uh, the messaging that we're sending um, in our external relationships on investments, so the sort of the taxonomy rules around what constitutes um, uh, green uh, uh, energy for, for the purposes of investment. Um, and you know, during the COP27 process, is some differences um, between that in terms of our approach to gas um, were highlighted by African um, leaders, for example. Um, so I would be keen to hear thoughts um, as well on. Um, how how do we square that circle um, between um, uh, the necessity of um, supporting economic development um, uh, in in the global south through this process um, at the same time as as, as keeping some um, consensus at a European level um, around um, around these things? So I'm not sure who wants to um, come in first um, or on what aspect of that. So we stick with uh, the same order. Otma, would you like to um, uh, come in on either of those pieces? Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for this uh, great question. So um, uh, let let me start uh, uh, with the uh, Green Deal and the Inflation Reduction Act. I think uh, to a certain extent, I would say these are two big and important global paradigms for climate policy. So in the European Green Deal, uh, we rely on, on standards, but also to a significant uh, extent on, on carbon pricing. We have one uh, ETS system, which is quite important. And the, exist the sheer existence of this ETS-1 is the reason why I'm not so much concerned that we are temporarily use more coal, because uh, in, in, in the end, there is a cap, and uh, this cap might then lead to will lead to an increasing CO2 price, but uh, so I don't expect a sharp increase in, in emissions, at least in Europe, in the power and the industry sector. So this is this is very good. This helps us uh, in this crisis. And this is the reason why we can be flexible to respond to, to energy security also in the short term, as, as highlighted by, uh, by Philip. So, um, and the, the, the Inflation Reduction Act relies very much on, on, on uh, subsidizing new technologies and and also it has a flavor of green protectionism to be honest uh, and and this is something which is a huge challenge uh, for Europe so in the end I think uh, I I I believe that we have to find a way that the 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 these two paradigms of the green deal and the inflation reduction will not lead to a, some kind of a, a trade conflict so I think this has to be overcome. So we will. So both sides will not gain too much if they are involved in in such a kind of a of a trade conflict. To be honest, I believe that the inflation reduction looks looks a little bit bigger than it is than it is. So if you look at the, the numbers, so it is it is not so dramatic as it, it as it looks like at the very beginning. Um, and and also when the US really wants to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 or something like this. Uh, it, it is quite quite clear to me that they cannot rely just on subsidies for new technologies. So because subsidizing new technology is a wonderful thing, but in the end, this will not lead to emission reduction. Why? Because with subsidizing new technologies, you build up a new the new capital stock, but you have no, no means to phase out or to to reduce the fossil fuel capital stock. And this has been highlighted several times uh, in, in Germany. So we, 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 we made the same experience that uh, the, the rebound effect uh, also plays against emission reduction. And one way to mitigate the rebound effect uh, to subsidizing and to incentivizing the new capital stock and to phase out the old one. So carbon pricing is at least not a sufficient but a necessary condition. So I, I believe in the end, in the US, they will make this the same the same experience. So, uh, and and also the the other thing is is uh, also quite interesting. You mentioned Susie, and then I will uh, I will leave it there. This is this is the gas and the oil issue. I, I believe that uh, due to the fact that we have now high gas prices, that we will see additional supply in in and in the in 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 the midterm. I don't think there will be a massive a massive uh, uh, supply problem with, with gas. So I think what we have to do is we have to make 
the institutional settings in the European Green Deal right. And this basically means we need either a, a strong ETS2 for building and transport, or this has to be complemented by other measures to reduce oil and, and, and gas demand uh, over the next two decades. So there is there is no no way to do this, no way no other way to do this. And let me emphasize one important, and then I, I I will leave it there when it comes to the international situation. We should not underestimate the enormous pace and 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 the economic impact of the ongoing climate crisis. So we have seen massive floods in 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 Pakistan. Uh, we have seen massive droughts in in Africa, and uh, so the whole debate on loss and damage since seems to be a very technical debate among climate diplomats. But in fact, I think the loss and damage debate will change the international climate di di diplomacy in a, in a very fundamental way. Why? Because we realize, because of the loss and damage debate, that the climate damages are increasing, rapidly increasing over time. I would like to give you just a number. Right? Today, the one ton of CO2 roughly causes a, a damage, let's say, a, roughly around $150 per ton CO2. If climate change will remain unabated, we will not reduce our emissions. This basically means over the next, by mid of the century, we have roughly climate damages, purely economic damages, impacts on the GDP around the globe, roughly around $800 per ton CO2. And this is something which shows that the climate crisis is, is, is a more long-term issue, but it is meanwhile clear that it is also a fundamental economic issue which has to be taken into account in this international uh, equation. So in, in that sense, uh, I, I think uh, climate diplomacy will, will change and uh, we have to find a way to overcome the potential trade conflicts between the US and, and Europe. I think that's, that's important. You. So you put faith over the long term in the economics that ultimately um, the cost of um, uh, adaptation um, will um, will uh, boost the, the support for, for mitigation. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, Philip Steinberg, can I turn to you next um, to pick into whichever parts of that you would like to? Yeah, I mean, very briefly on, on the IRA. I mean, I have, I have a slightly different take on, on the IRA than Otmar Enofer, who said who, 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 he wouldn't take it too seriously. I mean. Um, we have two two developments actually. Obviously, we have the IRA with a ma massive uh, uh, volume, uh, more than seven hundred uh, billion uh, euros uh, raised, uh, and and uh, then many other other lines. So it's it's really it's more than a trillion uh, dollars actually, which is which is uh, there. I mean, this is massive, and then obviously it's distortive. But then there's something Otmar didn't mention, and that's I mean I mean here in the Bundestag, like um, in the last. Uh, um, uh, negotiating the, the the gas and the and the electricity break. Now we are spending about 130 um, billion euros on on that. And um, and obviously, I mean, the companies tell us, you know, we have a double problem: gas prices and electricity prices to a lesser degree. But gas prices have about uh, now the before crisis level a megawatt hour cost uh, uh, 25, 27. Um, Euros now we are at uh, down again at 120 or so on. So, but still that is uh, that is is is, is um, about uh, five six times as much as high as pre crisis levels. So basically, um, and then we have the IRA and, and companies tell us, okay, listen, and if you don't manage to do something like the IRA and actually reduce electricity and and the gas prices, which are much lower in the US as well. Then we just leave. I mean, I, I take to I talk to Dow, I talk to, to BSF and so on. They they tell us this, and then I mean we have to do to actually do something about it. We are doing something about it with a very the, the most massive um, bill actually in the history of Germany. We are we are about to pass now, but at the same time we need to of course maintain and I totally agree maintain saving saving um, savings on uh, achieved savings and and obviously the gas uh, commission has. Has come forward with a model which is quite clever, and we are trying to implement it as much as possible. But still, obviously, there there are many problems. So what I'm saying there is, I mean, we really, I mean, I would obviously, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in the, in the, we're trying to, 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 to find compromises with all of that, dealing with the Ukraine crisis, higher gas prices, the IRA, and our the big companies telling us, listen, I mean, 
If I go to the United States, I get so much more subsidized, I have uh, subsidies, I have so much lower gas prices, and I, I, I run away. And, and, and then at the same time, trying to, to, to maintain transformation, this is really a challenge. We're trying to do this with gas, with intelligent gas and, and electricity price breaks, with obviously an, an, an answer, a European answer to our IRA, um, comprising a European, uh, European clean uh, technology initiative, um, like a policy mix, actually, where we try, obviously, to uh, adapt our policies, uh, like with the green industrial policy to this, those challenges. But it's really, I mean, things have become a bit more complicated, actually, if I may say so. And I think this, this needs to be reflected in those climate discussions we are, we are having now as well, because something has changed. And I think uh, that needs to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, those reflections. Do you allow me? So just to 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 clarify a misunderstanding. So sure. mm -hmm. because Philip said that there here's a slightly different view. I, I fully share you, your concern about uh, the gas prices and the Inflation Reduction Act. But what I'm saying is that exactly that that this this kind of protectionist way to 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 do things. Creates, creates a lot of problems which we have to deal with that. So I, I don't want to, to, to deny the enormous challenge the, the, uh, the inflation reduction that creates. So this would be a complete misunderstanding. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, but on the other hand, we, we welcome debate um, in this discussion. So it's good to have nuances of, uh, of disagreement at least. Um, hi, Kel, um, uh, I'm interested to, to get your take particularly um, uh, on this uh, relationship with um, with countries in the, the, the global south issue and um, uh, um, the investment rules, um, but also as part of your answer, we've had um, a, a, a few um, questions come up in in the Q and A chat, and so um, I wondered if in this round I could also um, throw into you the the, the question um, uh, which has been put um, about uh, the uh, sort of lack of. Um, cohesion um, within uh, the EU um, around the sort of um, uh, the, the right path um, to, to decarbonisation um, uh, in terms of the tools uh, that we use on, on this front and the sort of the different approaches that we see in member states, which obviously plays into this taxonomy question, um, which was quite divisive. So I wondered if you wanted to comment on that as well as part of it. Okay. Yeah. Now, so you have been referring first uh, on on uh, the situation, yeah, in the, in the global south. Um, as you may know, I mean, EIB is is active globally, so we are also uh, a lot of uh, uh, well um, financing projects um, in in 160 countries all over the world, and and climate is of course our primary focus there. And uh, what we what we see probably. Um, uh, uh, you you have uh, you have uh, seen that also in the news. It's a lot of uh, discussion around that. Um, uh, our talks, I mean that the, the talks that uh, Europe is having, for example, with Africa these days and with certain countries there on on pushing uh, on push, pushing green uh, green hydrogen. I think that that is, for example, um, a big opportunity for uh, for uh, both uh, both continents. But we have to do it rightly. It can't be a, a partnership where basically uh, Europe is is looking after uh, uh, another cheap uh, source of, uh, of of energy, and nothing uh, nothing remains in in our partner countries. So that is very important to play it uh, uh, politically, very in in an intelligent way, and 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 create win win partnerships there. Um, and uh, I think that that is what uh, what discussions are currently also about um, with uh, the German minister Habeck uh, doing a tour in in Africa and and uh, yeah getting himself an, an idea of what what are the opportunities there. Um, so uh, in so in that sense uh, uh, that is that is really where we we should look for more. Uh, collaboration uh, with the global south, and um, and that is probably also with a loss and damage fund. Uh, we we have another dimension where where we can take this uh, this into um, into consideration, and where Europe has to play a very important role um, and uh, uh, has to has to contribute its its part uh, to to that. Um, now, when you uh, when we we talk about um, uh, Europe as a whole, I mean, I would I would see, and I think I mentioned that earlier, 
Germany really in a, in a, in a driving seat for, for pushing uh, for pushing uh, uh, solutions uh, within Europe. And we are, when we are talking about uh, European industry and its uh, international competitiveness, uh, be it uh, with uh, the IRA uh, coming into in, on, in, in, onto speed and and others, uh, that that is that is really where um, yeah Germany can play a major role in, in being an industrial country um, in in coming up with uh, with initiatives uh, across Europe. And I think we need European initiatives and not national ones. Uh, the danger being that of course. Germany has much more power in, in generating uh, national solutions than other European countries may have. And that may create uh, uh, a conflictual situation at the European level. And it's, it's, it's very important that Europe uh, stays united in, 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 that, in that debate. Uh, what you were mentioning, uh, I mean, what, um, what the situation is between European countries. Yes, we, we see very diverging uh, uh, situations from the outset. I mean, if you just take our neighboring country, Poland, uh, which is mainly coal dominated, they are on a very different uh, uh, situation compared to, to Germany. Um, and, and there again, I think at a European level, there is, uh, well, there, there, there is a certain responsibility by, by pushing um, looking at, at at situations in different countries, but but finding still uh, a, a common drive to um, to push uh, to push for for green transition across Europe, and that's why European initiatives in that regard are are very important. And I think what we what we as Europeans have seen and uh, and and are very good at compared to. Um, uh, solutions we see uh, we see across the the Atlantic in in the U.S. is not just throwing uh, budgetary funds uh, uh, to to uh, to look for solutions, but also to um, enhance investment through um, guarantee uh, mechanisms and the like. Like we have seen it also in the pandemic, and that's what we think. Uh, what we think uh, we can do more of that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, maybe uh, it's sort of sticking with this this question of um, which which Heiko has alluded to on on the role that Germany can play uh, within the European context. We have um, uh, another question from Loyal Campbell at um, DGRP, which is which is related to this. And I'd, I'd be interested um, uh, in in your views, um, uh, Philip Steinberg, on. Uh, whether or not um, you see a role for Germany, and indeed, if you see sort of political will from the German government to play that role um, in the context of a sort of a, um, a changed uh, geopolitical landscape um, uh, following Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, um, to push for um, a more sober assessment um, at, at a European level um, uh, of what is what is needed um, in terms of the energy transition and um, the limitations or the gaps, if, at least in, in current plans. Um, or perhaps that is a role that you feel that Germany is, is already playing. Well, I mean, I mean, one thing is clear. I mean, this is this is trivial, obviously, that the the, the climate crisis is is, is, a, is a universal crisis. So we need to have European or universal approaches. So, so I mean, this is uh, five cents. Uh, obviously, it gets a bit bit more complicated once again. I mean, um, different countries are in different situations, and I don't want to overstress it. But I mean, the the the, the Ukrainian war and due to our our um, exacerbated uh, energy dependence on Russia. And the need to to, to act swiftly um, is something. Obviously, I mean, in a way, you know, I mean, we have brought ourselves uh, in this mess, and we have to get out of it as well. Of course, not without losing sight of Europe, and uh, and obviously, we are aware of of, of this that our two hundred billion euro um, uh, defense shield um, was not not perceived. Uh, like uh, only favorably um, in Europe, uh, even though I think there was a lot of misperce misperception on um, on it, on on the length, on what we are doing um, with it, on, on um, the other countries obviously having similar measures as, as well. Uh, and we had, of course, included um, like the, the need for European action as well in, in in that. But obviously, there is there is a feeling that uh, in some countries as well, uh, at least that. Uh, uh, that this is something uh, we did uh, like without European coordination. 
um, the questions a little bit, obviously, what, what would, would have been the European uh, uh, answer, what have been the uh, Germany's uh, uh, answer. And obviously, once again, there are in certain certain ways, uh, uh, different countries are in different situations. But of course, we need to act uh, unitedly. And so therefore, we have actually come uh, come up and we have supported the European Commission uh, with initiatives like uh, um, like the, the, the joint purchase platform for, for gas, uh, as well, uh, um, um, obviously, the oil embargo or the embargo measures have been taken very, I think, very, very effective, and their Europe was very, uh, very united. Obviously, we are pushing very hard um, for for more energy efficiency measures on the European level. There are many countries are not uh, that let's say not as 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 as, as uh, pushy as, as as we are. But then, of course, there are differences in the ideological or however you want to call it, the differences concerning nuclear, concerning. Um, um, uh, other, um, other, uh, like to question price caps or not on um, energy market design and so on. So obviously, we do want to push, and and uh, we, we we need to, um, but uh, and, and and we need to be a, we want to remain a front runner here. Of course, our targets are the most ambitious targets, and um, but uh, once again, I mean the the situation has become um, more compli uh, complicated, in, uh, and we have to take it take um, into account differences which are occurring and I think not for every problem in this uh, crisis situation we are in um, a European answer is, is the right one there are certain certain um, things national governments need to do themselves in the crisis uh, crisis uh, um, uh, combating mode kind of mm. thank you very much indeed um, interesting. Um, so um, uh, I think we've heard from all three um, uh, of, of you as speakers, um, Otmar, um, that, uh, you know, the, the reminder that one of the key lessons um, uh, of, uh, of, of this year has been um, about the importance of managing um, our dependencies um, as we transition uh, away from uh, carbon more effectively. Um, I, I would be really interested to get your assessment um, because you've obviously looked um, uh, at, at the geopolitics of climate change for a, for a number of years. We at TCFR have looked um, just in the context of um, 2022 um, at the uh, external deals which EU states um, have been striking um, around the energy picture. Um, and what we can see um, from that fairly simple um, exercise um, is uh, the, uh, the the risk um, of us kind of shifting to, um, uh, to to new dependencies, at least in the short term, but with long term implications in terms of infrastructure and so on, particularly with um, the Gulf states, um, but also on the LNG side uh, with the US and so on um, at uh, some sort of somewhat turbulent time um, in, in, in that relationship. Um, so I would be um, sort of keen to hear sort of how uh, what what sort of mark would you give um, uh, on on our work so far in in 2022 um, as the EU in, in kind of managing um, that risk looking forward um, and also sort of playing into that um, as we move towards uh, clean um, uh, energy sources and the technology that will be needed around that, um, how well we're sort of equipping ourselves for, for that picture. There's also, um, if you wouldn't mind um, taking it as part of um, that, a very specific question for you in the chat um, on what price um, you're anticipating um, uh, under the ETS um, uh, for, for, for carbon um, in, in 2025 and 2030, if you want to put a figure on it. Yeah, I start with the last one because this is the most simple one and uh, it comes from, from yours. Um, <laughs> and um, of course, price predictions are complicated and everything, what I can say, everything depends here on the deployment on renewables. So the faster the deployment of renewables, the lower is the CO2 price. And, and, and this is something which, which is quite important uh, to understand. I would say there is a, what we are doing now is we, we analyzing different scenarios. Some of the scenarios which are quite pessimistic about the deployment of renewables uh, come up with above 100 euros per ton CO2. I would say roughly uh, around 100 euros per ton CO2 is, is, is something which is, which is realistic. But this is not, not something which is, which is, uh, which is given uh, by heaven, so to say. Uh, this is subject to some political decisions and deployment of renewables in Europe is, is quite decisive uh, to, to tame uh, also the, the, the price development in, in ETS-1. 
needless to say, and this brings me a little bit to the to 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 the second uh, half of your question. So uh, I, I showed that if you if you look at the European Green Deal even before 2030, this the implication is a reduction of oil and gas demand. Uh, the question is how to manage this, and I would say uh, there there are two things. First, we have to diversify the supply. Uh, uh, of, of of gas and oil, so that's that's important. So reducing uh, dependency means basically diversification of of of, uh, of 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 supply. And on the other side, I think it is also quite important that uh, US and Europe will send a, a strong signal uh, to the uh, oil and the gas market uh, that the uh, the gas consumption and the oil consumption will will decline, and this will have severe implications on the international gas and oil market. And therefore, I believe that Europe as a whole should play a role, a strategic role on, on the global gas and on the global oil market. And I think this is probably one of the best, let's say, uh, uh, so we, this is a, a, a very reasonable entry point to do this, because in the end, uh, to, to, to play a joint role on, on this market gives Europe an opportunity to to send to send strong signals, and also to 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 give European strategic a strategic position. So in in and combine it so to say with the tools which are already underway, like the second ETS for transport and building. Uh, so this uh, second ETS might might weak uh, in the beginning, but it can grow and can be strengthened. So in that sense, um, and and this this ETS two can have also. A very strong uh, geopolitical implication because because in in the end uh, this uh, will lead to a reduction of uh, uh, gas and oil demand even before 2030. I think that's that's important and 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 we should not forget, despite of the problems of of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and despite of the the the, the, the protectionism, um, also US has highlighted and announced that they want to achieve carbon neutrality by mid of century. And this will also imply for them to reduce to a certain extent oil and gas demand. And if these two uh, economic powerhouses will do this, this is a strong signal to the market. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, an hour has absolutely flown by um, uh, and uh, we're, we're already coming to time. Um, so I, I, I think I'm going to have to um, draw the discussion um, to a close. Um, but I do want to, um, uh, before I do, thank you all. Um, you've covered so many aspects of a very complex problem um, uh, in, in, in that hour, and you've been really generous with, um, uh, with, with very thoughtful um, contributions to, to, to a rich discussion. So um, I'd, I'd like to finish by just saying it doesn't look like 2023 is going to be um, any easier than 2022 um, in terms of managing the balance of all these challenges. So perhaps we can already invite you to come back in a year's time and we can reflect back on um, uh, on climate leadership uh, after that period as well. Um, but uh, with that, um, I will I will close the session and wish you all um, a good evening.